the brain develops much like a house in two parts. If you have a, a two-story house, the downstairs is built before the upstairs. The downstairs brain, if you're using the brain in the palm of the hand model, which is very simplified, oversimplified, but it works for us, right? We're not neuroscientists. We don't need to know about glial cells. So here's the brain stem. It's at the base of the hand. The brain stem is connected to the spinal cord, which is represented by this part of your arm. And so there's the spinal cord, uh, cord coming up here, and here's your brain stem, okay? So look, there's your palm in the hand. The brain stem works in conjunction with the limbic center. These two parts compose what Daniel Siegel calls the downstairs brain. Brain stem, limbic center. Okay, so this part of the brain is responsible for a lot of automatic functions. Things we gratefully don't have to think about. Heartbeat, blood pressure, um, digestion, a lot of body reg regulation, emotional reactivity, fight, flight, freeze, or faint. So a lot of us remember fight or flight. There's a lot of talk of fight or flight, but we forget the two other Fs, freeze and faint. That's an automatic reaction that your body, you don't have to think about with your brain. Your brain just automatically takes care of that, right? So the brain is scanning for, is this good? Is this bad? Should I go toward it? Should I go away from it? Your mind's giving input because it's casting its attention places, and then your brain's taking that in and going, oh, should I go towards it? Should I go away? Is it good or is it bad? The brain likes to put things in categories. It likes to categorize to make sense, to organize, so it can be efficient. I, I don't have time. I don't have time. I'm just going to efficiently fight, flight, freeze, or faint. This is where motivation is believed to start as well because of this. I go toward it. I go bad it. And attachment. We are wired early on from birth to attach to others, to go toward our attachment figures because our brain knows we can't survive without them. So downstairs brain, overly simplified, but this is partly what it does. Now we have the upstairs brain. This upstairs brain you can think of as if you close the rest of your hand over the downstairs brain. This is called the cortex or the neocortex. And for our purposes, I'm gonna talk about the social emotional aspects, the part that is really important um, especially for teachers and parents, but clinicians as well. All of it's important, but the social emotional aspects of the upstairs brain include, let me give you the, I always forget to do my PowerPoint, focal attention. So this is a biggie for everybody. Everybody's like, oh, pay attention, pay attention, oh my, pay attention. Well, now we're looking, this is the, an upstairs brain function. So is impulse control. We talk about impulse control, focal attention, and then the nine functions of the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is from your um, knuckles down to the base of your fingernails in this model. The prefrontal cortex is a very regulatory area, very integrative area, and Daniel Siegel highlights nine functions. There's more, but the nine that he highlights are, let's see if I can remember them today, attuned communication, emotional regulation, physical regulation, Response flexibility, the ability to shift gears when necessary, be flexible, accept a second choice, think about something in a different way. Uh, fear modulation, insight, empathy, intuition, and morality. Just that. <laughs> yeah. Just that. Now we go into executive function skills. They're also believed to be largely housed there. All parts of the brain are involved, but largely how's there? You ready for these? The ability to plan, initiate, organize, carry out a task while regulating your emotions, resolving conflicts as they arise, shifting gears when necessary, and tracking your ability to do so as you're doing it. Just that. <laughs> so here's all parts of your brain. You've got this upstairs and this downstairs brain, and you may notice that in this model, all parts are touching, right? They're all connected, they're linked. But when do you believe that the human brain is fully developed? When does this happen? 25. Any other guesses? Seven. Seven. 27. 27. Any other guesses? 
Never. Never. 38. <laughs> She's thinking about her partner. Uh, 38. We're hoping. Fingers crossed next year. So mid 20s is the current belief. Again, that may change. Mid 20s. Don't wait for 25. Don't wait for 27. It's not a distinct number. You'll hear that. I patently disagree with that. What child starts to walk at the exact same age, right? There's a general range, but you can't wait for one discrete age for something to happen. Let's give herself some wiggle room. Neuroatypical, <coughs> you know, trauma, we can't just say, right? So mid-20s is the current belief. And that's why adolescence now, too, is believed to be 12 to 25. That's probably where a lot of times where people get 25, too, right? <laughs> So, and that's why rental car companies won't rent to somebody who's 25 alone. Because they know about this, that you know, their brain's just coming online. We're not giving them this car. Okay. So the idea is, once our brain is fully developed, it's considered to be integrated. All the differentiated parts are linked. Differentiation and linkage equals integration. Integration means well-being. 